Nature is wild. But some organisms have discovered, if you work together, you can get ahead. When two or more different types of organisms live closely together and interact in the interest of survival, it's called symbiosis. Intentional symbiotic relationships are surprisingly common in nature. These relationships can look different depending on who benefits from the relationship. Relationships are complicated, and in nature, they're no different. These partnerships can be either mutualistic, commensalistic, or parasitic. Mutualism is when both organisms benefit from living closely with each other, like these aphids. They produce a sugary substance called honeydew from their back end, and the ants are obsessed. In exchange, the ants care for and protect the aphids from predators and parasites. Or there are the red-billed oxpeckers that travel around on herd animals. The birds get a ride and a meal of ticks and other parasites living on the herd animal's skin. Oxpeckers get food, and the rhinos, zebras, giraffes, and other herd animals get pest control. In the ocean, the anemone protects the clownfish with its toxic tentacles. Don't worry, the clownfish are immune. And at the same time, the clownfish rids the anemone of parasites and feeds it with fish poo. I'm not here to judge. Lastly, this lichen is a complex organism made of fungi and algae. The fungi gets nutrients from the photosynthesizing algae, and the algae is protected by the fungi, allowing it to survive in harsh environments where it would normally dry out and die. On the other hand, if only one organism benefits from the relationship while the other is neither helped nor harmed, it's called commensalism. Algae grows in wet areas with lots of sunlight, so a manatee's skin is a great place for algae to live, and the manatees don't really seem to mind. These beautiful bromeliad plants use their specialized roots to cling to tree trunks and branches taking nothing but support from trees, drawing their water and nutrients from air and moisture that accumulates between their leaves, like tiny little cups storing water for later. The partnership you don't want to find yourself a part of is parasitism. In these relationships, one organism benefits at the expense of another. One is helped while the other is hurt. The survival of most parasites is tied to the survival of their host, but these organisms can cause illness and eventually the death of the host. Ticks feed on the blood of larger hosts for sustenance and survival. Saliva from infected ticks can also transmit disease-causing pathogens into the host. Well, that's not good. Cuckoo birds lay their eggs in other species' nests instead of building their own so they don't have to spend energy raising young. Sometimes, the parasite species will even kick the other species' eggs out of the nest. Well, that's rude. The poor unsuspecting victim just ends up raising some other bird's kids. There are tons of other parasites, from tapeworms to fleas and even mistletoe. But by far, the strangest example out there has to be cordyceps fungus. Cordyceps infiltrate their insect host, where their hyphae then grow into the body and absorb nutrients from non-essential organs while controlling their brains. When the fungus is ready to reproduce, it directs its host to march to a cool, moist location in the forest where spores erupt through the insect's head to spread in the wind. Like I said in the beginning, relationships are complicated. It would be wonderful if we could just organize every relationship definitively in their nice, tidy box, but we can't. Symbiotic relationships are more of a moving scale, depending on the type of behavior being engaged in. Let me explain. Let's look back at our manatee with the algae. If the algae is thick enough to provide some kind of sunscreen to the manatee, their relationship becomes more mutualistic. 
While ticks are gross and no one wants a tick just chilling on them, if they are free of disease, which you can't tell by just looking at them, and there's only one, the amount of blood that they're taking is so small that most organisms wouldn't be affected at all, so it would be more commensalistic. And if you happen to be a possum, the relationship could even be considered mutualistic. Until you're the tick and you're getting eaten by the possum. Possums can eat up to 5,000 ticks a week. We really need to learn what mutualistic behavior looks like along with commensalistic and parasitic behaviors because two organisms can change their behavior just like we can. So try not to be a parasite today. And if you want to learn more science, you can check out this video next.